those of those of you who know Quincy, he needs no introduction. Uh, but he's the guy, you know, hanging around him and, and Walter and hearing it for about three years. Then I finally started our own little self-directed IRAs, HSA. Um, got my kids hooked up with a, a, a what do you call it, inherited Roth yep. IRA. Did that, and it's all because of these guys. I had to hear it, like, for two years before I opened the account, just because, like, I just have to hear things a while before it becomes actionable. So you got to keep hanging around. If you feel like you're having your your brains exploding, that's you're right on track for where you're supposed to be. So congratulations. But anyway, if I keep every time I listen to these guys, plus he's funny as hell, and uh, and I enjoy him, and he's got the biggest warmest heart, and he's super smart, and uh, your your quest thing has become bigger and bigger and bigger, and now you're stepping up, and you can tell us about that. So my dear yep. friend Quincy, who is um, an awesome guy, and I owe a lot to you. So thank you for being here. Well, thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here, of course. So, okay, well, anyway, so what I'll do is introduce myself again for those who haven't uh, met me before and only heard of me. So anyway, I am currently president of Quest IRA, Inc., and of course what we do is we handle self-directed IRAs, and that means nothing more than you can buy real estate promissory notes, which is why we're here, right? Uh, uh, private companies, like I own part of a bank in uh, my IRAs, a privately held bank, you know, LLCs, limited partnerships, trusts, which we'll talk just a little bit about. Anyway, that's what we do. And as she indicated, uh, my uh, company is converting to a Texas trust company. We filed the certificate of formation this morning, and so we'll be up and running as a trust company on November 1st. So ask me about, ask me about that later when we're in wine time, okay? Uh, so anyway, I'm also an attorney at law, licensed in Texas since 1991. I'm a certified IRA services professional, which means I actually do know quite a bit about IRAs, not just real estate. Uh, I was a fee attorney for American Title Company for about 10 years, and so that was interesting training. I'm, I authored a whole bunch of stuff, including co-authoring and editing the book uh, about self-directed IRAs with Dyke Spotterford and George Eider. And as I'm standing up here shaking like a crazy man, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a PWP. That's a person with Parkinson's. We're trained not to say that we're victims or suffering or something like that. It's just something we live with. So if you see me jumping around like this, trust me, I'm not nervous. <laughs> I've done this a lot of times. But unfortunately, a side effect of the medicine is the uncontrollable movement in my leg. So apologize for that. It's distracting, but there it is. Okay, so of course I have my own disclaimer because I am a lawyer, so <laughs> Quest IRA Inc. and soon to be Quest Trust Company, we don't give tax, legal, investment, or structuring advice, and we don't endorse any products, investments, or techniques of any type. So basically you have to get your own information, your own, you know, financial advisors, attorneys, CPAs, whatever, and uh, we don't handle any of that. We just handle your money in a neutral manner. Everybody got that? Say yes, Quincy. Yes, Quincy. Okay, very good. Now we can go on. Uh, I don't remember why I put this slide in here, but that's the types of accounts that we do the self-direction in. We can have traditional Roth IRAs. Those are just for the individual personal accounts. We can do SEP Simple and 401ks for those who are employers, even if you're self-employed, they count for you. And we can do the, what you call, would you like fries with that accounts, the smaller accounts of the Coverdell Education Savings Account and the Health Savings Account. So just anything I say, we're doing an IRA, fill in your mind, IRA, 401ks, HSAs, Coverdells, it's all applicable to what we're doing, okay? So the key, I always like to put this slide in here because the key to good investing is doing what? You gotta do the do. Do the do, as in do the due diligence. 
And in real estate investing, including notes, there's really two different types of due diligence you have to do. You have to do diligence on the property and the note, right? But here's something I learned from the School of Hard Knocks. You have to do due diligence on the people you're doing business with. And uh, on wine time, I can tell you all about the interesting experiences I've had with uh, not doing proper due diligence on the people I'm doing business with. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there. That's just basic stuff. So what I decided to do is just kind of give you some hints from my own portfolio, the various things that I have done over the years. And so I like telling personal stories because it works better that way. I know the details and I can, you know, express the weak points and the good points and the bad points. So I'm going to start off with the assumption that you know basically now what I do. So I'm not going to, you know, uh, go over the basic stuff. I'm just going to jump right in if that's okay. And this is uh, one of my nice deals that I've done. So I loaned a investor $35,000 to purchase and rehab a mobile home on land. So the mobile home is one of the nicer mobile homes. It's like an acre of land and the mobile home's like 2,000 square feet. And it's got a great massive deck on the back of the mobile home that goes all the way across the back and a cedar post fence all the way around the property and it's on a slight hill and as you look down the hill at the bottom of the hill there's a little pond where the wild birds uh, land and it's it's very nice and it's not like i don't know if some people when you're not real educated about mobile homes in certain areas you just picture a trailer park no this is where this is where people go where they want a little room for their kids to run around and get out of the city. So it's just a little bit southwest of Fort Worth, Texas. So $35,000 to buy and fix it up and I charge only 10% interest. So you know it's a, a good deal for me if it's only 10% interest, right? Because usually I charge more than that. And I loan the money to him for five years and basically then here's the way it works and this is called a shared appreciation note who's done the shared appreciation equity notes so there's only one person see that's why i know this is kind of basic but i'm kind of going back to the basics i'm not talking about buying notes that are already done i'm talking about creating notes does that make sense so i'm just trying to give you a feel for the variety so the way a shared appreciation uh, notes work is basically you get an interest rate, yes, but then you split the equity in some way. In this, in this case, I split the equity 50-50 and got 10% interest. You might wonder why that sounds kind of greedy, but the truth of the matter is that's because the after-tax net-net-net yield after all expenses was about 20%. So we figured, well, I'll, I should get 10% and my investor should get 10% and we'll split the equity. I get my money back when the property is sold and uh, we'll split the equity. So basically, what did my partner get? Basically half a house for free, right? What did I get? A hands-off investment because this is in a retirement account. Actually, this one's in my HSA. So this is in a retirement account. So what do I get? I get a hands-off investment. He does all the tenants and toilets and management and repairs and does all that stuff, right? And all I do is see money coming into my bank, 10% interest. And when we sell this property, it's worth about 90,000 now. So when we sell this property, I'll get uh, profit and my money back. Now, what do you think as note people? What do you think of that scenario? Yay, no. It's good, but you have to have uh, stuff specified. That is very correct. Like your construction budget, you have to make it an addendum to your... Exactly note. right. Yeah. So the comment is you have to have a very clear definition of what is equity appreciation. What's it going to cost? And what are the... Uh, what if you make repairs, capital repairs? You've got to take all that into account when you decide what's equity appreciation. Because, for example, just because you... Uh, 
have that situation? What if, what if you put a roof on it? Does that count or not? What if you just go fix the water heater? Does that count or not? So the trick to doing shared appreciation equity notes is to clearly define what equity is. And, uh, you know, I've done a number of these. This is just a simple example, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, it may work out very well. Okay, now we're going to go into a, a thing that I participated in, but not as Fred. He's uh, basically, Fred is basically got a small amount, only five or six hundred dollars he had in the account. And he was trying to figure out how to grow it. Anybody uh, familiar with that problem? Uh-huh. I see a lot of heads nodding there. So what he did, though, is he had a good network. Al, you have a good network? I do. You, he does. So pay attention now. So basically what he did is he had a real estate investor that needed to borrow, uh, it's hard to read from here, 50K or something? Is that 55. 55K, right. And he was ready to do a purchase, rehab, and flip. Now, without the risk of getting myself into trouble, I've done all of these transactions. Okay, so this is really stuff that I've actually done. Okay, so pay attention to that. And so he knew somebody that needed $55,000. And he knew people that had self-directed accounts, right? And so what he did is he kind of met the two together and we had... Five, six IRAs, six IRAs and two Coverdell Education Savings Account for a $55,000 loan, including Fred's. So Fred put in 1% of the money, or 550 bucks, and he had, had the investors put up the rest of the money. I was one of the other investors. So then he told the uh, person that needed the money, the in flipper, that he would give him 12% interest and two points. Okay, that's typical terms here, right? And then he told this us investors, well, he paid 12% that he would keep the points. Awesome. Now, what do you guys think of that? That's awesome. <laughs> now, did I care at all in any way, shape, or form whether or not he kept those points? Yeah. Nope. It was a hands-off investment for me and it was no problem. Now let me finish the story though before I make some points. So basically, God, that is hard to read from a distance. Fred's Roth IRA participated in Yeah, there you go, 1%. So he put his 550 up and then we put the rest up and... Try to get it closer to the points. Well, I, I'm going blind is the problem. What does it say? Because the two points were paid at close. Oh yes, there you go. So. He got his two points up front, which is how much? 1100 1100 Is that a pretty good return so far? Yeah. And then he got his payments also, 1% a month. So in the end, he made a pretty good deal on that. You can read the number, I can't. But he got a really good deal on that investment. And frankly, I got a pretty good deal on the investment too, because I didn't have to do a damn thing. And I got 12% interest. I don't remember what my portion was, but... I was doing that mainly to be a nice person. So what do you guys think of that? Mm -hmm. Now, whoops, I don't want to get into that yet. Now, what's the problem with that scenario? Can anybody figure out what an issue, issue might be in that scenario? Is he UBIT or running a business in there? Or? There's a couple of different issues that it could be. So what I'm telling you is that this is not always a completely in the white area, risk-free type of situation. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. So certainly Quest does not author, is not saying that this, you should do this, but this is an example of somebody named Fred, okay, it's not his real name, that did this, and what risk does he run? Well, first of all, let's take a practical view of this. Is the IRS ever likely to audit this account and see that this account went from 550 to 1600 in six months or eight months or however long it was? No. Probably not. But is that reason to not do it right? No, it just means you're evaluating the risk. Remember when I spoke earlier, I said you had to evaluate, not have the, not only the investment techniques, but the risk factors associated with that. Did I say that, Al? 
Yes, okay. what's your question? My question is, so the points are, are uh, doesn't seem the points is not the business. So that it's probably the two, the five dollars and fifty cents a month that we have to pay UBIT on, right? Okay, so the question is, the worst case, five dollars a month. UBIT. Well, let's back up a step. What's probably the bigger danger than UBIT? The UBIT is not really a factor here, but uh, what's the bigger factor? Not UBIT, but who all the parties were that participated? Unrelated business income tax. I'll get to that. Trader business, maybe, like if it's if it's frequent. Well, he's done one transaction. Is this going to be a problem with unrelated business income tax? No. I don't think so. It depends no. on who the other invest accounts were that were Well, of course, assume that all the, you know, if I participated, they were all non-disqualified persons to each other. So he doesn't have any scaling value. He does. He That's, has 1%. He's got 1%. So it's an issue. I'll just give it to you because it's an issue of two potential problems that if the IRS ever did look at it, that they might bring up. One is it might be considered as a service and providing services to your IRA could be a problem, right? The other thing it could be is an excess contribution because he used his contacts to put the deal together. Now, do I think this guy is sweating at night, worried about it? No. But again, it's not, you know, it's not clear because the rules sometimes just give you things to worry about and don't give you clear answers. Everybody kind of understand that? Yes, sir. Is there a statute of limitations on this transaction? Good question. What's the statute of limitations on the transactions? Well, it's an interesting question. It's either none or uh, as long as the period lasts for that tax filing, because what would be the penalty for doing a prohibited transaction would be the IRA would be disqualified as of January 1st, the year in which you did the transaction. You think they're going to go after that big penalty on a $550 IRA? Probably not, but again, no guarantees. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, if it were a bigger deal and he were taking commissions with the securities. Well, it might be a bigger deal if he was, if, if it was a bigger deal and especially if he was a professional hard money lender. That would be a different scenario, wouldn't it? Because now it's not just an investment, it's what you do for a job. For example, if you, um, you ever seen uh, signs, we buy ugly houses? Mm -hmm. to, a, to a person with one of those franchises, what is it that a house is? Is it capital or is it inventory? inventory. It's inventory. Well, what is it to me? If I'm not in that business, what is it to me? It's just capital investment, right? So something, in some ways, if you do things one time, it may be one thing. If you do it 50 times, it may be something entirely different. So I'm not trying to bum everybody out. I'm just trying to say that you got to know the rules that you play by, like I said earlier, and evaluate the risk of whether you want to participate. Now, I participated in this because, frankly, I was just getting 12% interest. I was clearly just a lender. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Again, I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff out there to get some discussion going. Okay, now we talked about wraps. Okay, I'm sorry, I have to move, sorry. Uh, we talked about wraps a little bit earlier, so I wanted to show you a couple of different deals that I did. One of them was way back in 2002, but this is what I call a classic wrap note, and is distinguished from a simultaneous wrap. So I want to go over that because it's important some of you need to understand how that works. But basically, in almost all techniques that I'm going to show you today, not that I'm endorsing any of them, did I say that before? Uh, but in all techniques, what we're really doing is arbitrage. We're using somebody else's money to make money for ourselves. Does that make sense, everything? This is a classic pre-foreclosure deal. Yeah, it was in foreclosure, and we bought the property in 2002 on March 4th and we bought it subject to the existing mortgage. Everybody understands that from the earlier discussion? She just gave us a deed to the property subject to the existing mortgage, which was in foreclosure, okay? Now, the principal mortgage balance when we bought it was 53958 okay? And it was a 15-year note with uh, 142 months remaining, so she had nicely made 138 38 payments out of the loan. So 
if you ever seen something that amortization schedules, do they amortize quickly the shorter the loan is? Yes. Yeah, the, the balance goes down very quickly, doesn't it? Right? So the fact that it was a 15-year loan with 38 months already paid on it made it a quickly amortizing loan, okay? The interest rate was 6%. Now, I know that's horrible these days, but back in 2002, that was a pretty good interest rate, okay? And the monthly payment on that first lien was 531.63. Does everybody understand those? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I sold that property a few months later, about four months later, and I sold it with eight, for $80,000 with $9,000 down and a $71,000 mortgage balance with a loan term of 20 years. Now, so I had, this is what pan, uh, that we were talking about earlier was that sometimes you just capture this for the tail, right? Because once that mortgage is paid off, I get the whole amount, right? In the meantime, this payment was at, in, at an interest rate that's higher than the underlying, was 10%, and their monthly payment was 685.17. So the ladies that bought this were paying me 685.17. What was I paying? Oh, well, damn, I keep doing that. I've got the paper. You were paying 531.63. Okay, so everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So I was using the lady who was in foreclosure and she would have lost the house. I was using her financing that is existing in place and I was paying the underlying lender 531.63 and she was, the new buyers were paying me 685.17. So how's that? I get a little cash flow every month, but what else do I get? I get principal pay down, don't I? Now, is a loan with 6% interest, which has 142 months remaining, or in this case now it would be 138, because it had been four months, but is, a, is that going to amortize quicker than a loan for 20 years at 10% interest? So let's take a look at that. These are just the first four payments. Now, the, the first, it just got a light, okay. No, it doesn't. Uh, well, the first, she was paying me, uh, the, or uh, with the first lien, the payments I was making to the first lien holder were 265, 267, 268. So that was reducing principal by quite a bit. But it, because hers was a brand new 20 year note at a higher interest rate, she was only reducing my balance by 95 bucks a month and so I was gaining not only the cash flow but equity every month I was increasing the equity and uh, so at the end of the deal let's see what happened uh, so I so they paid it off they refinanced it paid it off 2003 about 18 months that I've had the loan the property and so the principal balance on the first lien had gone down to 48465.73. Hmm. hmm. And who paid that? Me or them? You with Well, my did with their help, right? And but their balance went down from 71 all the way down to 69406. So I had what, a $5,000 pay down and they had a uh, $1600 pay down. Does that sound like a reasonable deal to you guys? Yeah. And so the equ wrap equity at payoff, in other words, what I owed the underlying lender and what they owed me was over $20,940. Okay. And then I also got one hundred and fifty-three fifty-four, which was the difference between those two payments for 16 months for a total of $2,456.64. So total deal flow was worth to me in 18 months of 23,397.63. Everybody see it? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So, Clinton, did you pay anything to the person who, whose property was there? Did I do what? Did you pay any money to the person whose property was originally the one? Yes, I paid a little money to her to uh, move out and keep sniffing. <laughs> 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 yes, but the $9,000 covered that. Remember, I sold it for eighty dollars with $9,000 down, 
and the nine thousand dollars covered um, the money I gave her so that she could move out of the house and also covered the monthly payments in between so I broke even on that so I just didn't emphasize that part of the story but does everybody see how a wrap can work uh, so I just thought that was something that people should know now this is a classic wrap which means the seller of the property has already got a debt on the property and they're trying to sell it and the wrap around loan in that case is a seller finance option okay a seller finance type of structure and so does everybody kind of understand that a little better from this morning's discussion okay so now I'm going to show you a deal that Walter and I did on a simultaneous wrap now simultaneous wrap is something entirely different but it works on the same concept so Walter could buy a house at $27,000 and he can sell it if he can buy the property he can sell it for $48,000 with $4,000 down payment right because what does seller financing add? Value, right? Seller financing adds value to the price of the property, doesn't it? Yeah. And so this was the differential. Now, so, but what he needed was uh, 31,000, he wanted it, let me say this, he, he wanted $31,000. Why? Because Wally likes to eat, in case you all hadn't noticed. <laughs> And uh, he likes to eat, so he's going to get $4,000 out of the deal minus closing costs, right? And what else is he going to collect besides the $4,000 for closing? He's also going to pick up the down payment from the new buyers, right? Which were the tenants. Is that right, Walter? Was it? Right. So what do you think? Wally puts $8,000 in his pocket. But Wally doesn't like to use his own money. I don't really blame him for that. Anybody think you need money to do real estate? No, did I tell you that before? <laughs> you need a network, you need access to money. So Wally calls me up and says, Quincy, do you know anybody that would think that a, a, a loan at uh, $31,000 at 7.75% with 103 payments, that's about eight and a half years, uh, for 414.16, you think somebody would be interested in that? Now, not everybody's a greedy bastard like us people in this room. <laughs> and so for some people, that's a pretty darn good return on investment, isn't it, Ashley? Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought about that, and I said, I, I think I probably it took me less than 10 minutes to make a couple of phone calls. Somebody said that would be a great return for me. And it happened to be somebody who was subject to RMDs, required minimum distributions, and he had to make sure he beat his RMD amount every year. And so that was going to accomplish that goal. So he thought it was a pretty good deal. So he said, yeah, I'll do that. And then what Walter and I did, or what Walter did, is we then created a wrap loan of $44,000, 48 minus 4, 7.75%, 180 payments of 414.16 each. Now, isn't that weird? That's the same number. I wonder how that happened. But you see what we're doing? We're, we're just for figuring out how many of the payments do we have to sell or as a partial or in the, this case create as the first lien to get the same number we're looking for. So we manufacture the note according to what we need to accomplish. Okay, as opposed to just taking it as is and trying to work with it as is. Yes, Abby. What happens if you put this together and you back into this, like you had just mentioned, yes. and then your 7.75% investor bails at the last minute? Well, how can he happen? bail? Well, I don't know. I mean, things happen. I'm just saying, uh, has that ever occurred? Or well, I, it probably has. It didn't occur to me in this case. Okay, I was just kind of curious. Frankly, it, it would have taken me another 10 minutes or so to find somebody else. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Uh, yeah, please. Um, so... Because it takes longer to amortize 44000 than 31000 at the same interest rate. Does everybody see that? Is that an interesting scenario? But in this case, look what we're doing. Unlike the first case, here what we're doing is we're creating the underlying first and the wraparound second at the same time. That's something different than doing a classic wrap. So just be aware of that. This is not a do-it-yourself project, generally. Yeah. Uh, and so I said, but Walter, what's in it for me? I mean, because I used up $31,000 of capital, I could have used it, you know, 
7.75%, right? But it wasn't your capital. Well, that's not the point. He says, it's not my capital. It's not the point. It's my network. So I said, what's in it for me? So Walt says, tell you what, I'll sell whatever. Uh, could somebody get me a water up here, by the way? Uh, I'll sell whatever account you want, the half of the wrap note for 500 bucks. Now, so what does that mean? The account will get 207.08 a month in the last hundred and uh, in the last uh, 77 payments. Thank you. Do you just want it here? It's fine. Okay. So the, the account will get 77 payments of half the payment. So that's going to be 207.08 a month, right? And uh, it invested $500, so it'll have a 15,445.16 profit. Is that not too bad? But let's, let's not get all giddy about it, because what's, what do we set up here? We set it up so that the account gets nothing for eight and a half years and takes the chance, right, that something's going to go wrong in those eight and a half years. And uh, so what's the, what's the value of that, really? Nobody can tell you, right? It was worth 500 bucks to me. Now, we were talking about uh, inherited IRAs and passing wealth down. There comes a point, this is a kind of a personal thing with me, there comes a point in which you have enough. And when you get there, you got to start giving it away or working my kid's account. So why would I ever put a $500 investment in my daughter's Roth IRA? For example, why wouldn't I put it in a Coverdell IRA? A Coverdell ESA, sorry. Why wouldn't I do that? Because if it's in a Roth, it's it's taxed. It's already taxed. Well, in the in a Roth in a Roth, it's in a Coverdell. You don't pay any money on the tax. The money pulled out for education expenses. So why wouldn't I do that? No restrictions. There's no restrictions, but if you pulled it out for educational expenses, you'll get out of the penalty, but not the taxes. Well, no, so why, why would I do this? In a Roth, your profits are going to roll over without a tax consequence. Well, that's true. They're in the Roth, but they'll do the same thing in the Coverdell. Well, she's young. She doesn't need the, the cash. The problem is my daughter was 17 at the time. It's too late for me to do something that starts eight and a half years from now. I'll buy your position. You'll buy my position? Well, we might, but anyway. Well, this is an old deal anyways. I've seen it about three times. Well, thank you for pointing it out, but not everybody's seen everything. So the point of the matter is, what did Wally get out? He got $8,000 or so. And what else did he get? Half of those last 77 payments. So you see, was this a good deal for Wally? Was it a good deal for my daughter? It's a win-win situation. Was it a good deal, Walter, for the tenants that bought it? Because? Well, it's less than rent. And because it was less than rent. That's an $800 run. So what's happening is Walter is setting these people up for success, not failure. Does that make sense, everybody? They're going to be homeowners instead of renters and pay less. And yet we make good money on the deal. That's a win-win-win scenario, and you could go up to that. But think about the Roth. And I didn't finish my point. On the Roth... Why would I do that? I'll be long dead before my daughter uses that Roth IRA for anything, right? So why would I do that? Because I'm going to give it to her anyway, because there's no way a skinflint like me is ever going to use all my money up. So that she's going to get it anyway. Why not give it to her now? Then we don't have to worry about inheritance, taxes, or anything else. So just a point on that. Anyway, it was an interesting scenario, and I'll talk to you later about uh, buying me out, Walter. <laughs> Either way. Oh, one more point before I go on. Uh, what's the likelihood that I'll let that $500 investment go? No. Zero. No, would roll over. So <laughs> what I'm doing is the person who had the first lien in this situation, the person who had the first lien, were they pretty secure just in general? Mm -hmm. It was a pretty low loan to value, right? Almost at as is value, right? But they had a greedy person behind them who's not going to let it go into default. Or if it is, does go into default, it's going to be saying like, well, I'm going to make the payments up or something because to protect my equity position. 
So that's a pretty strong position for that first lien holder to be in. Now, without kind of emphasizing this, this was the one way we did structure it. I'm just going to point out in a wrap, by the way, this is the difference. This is the payments on that $31,000 note, and it goes down to zero. And this is the profit on the wrap. And when it gets to this point, it's getting all the profit. And up here, it's getting the difference between the two. So it's just the kind of a, you know, the wrap equity. And I don't know, I thought I'm a terrible at graphs, so that's the best I could do. Sorry about that. So let's just say the same scenario. Could you do it other ways? Yeah, and I'm just going to hit this really quickly. You could do it uh, and just sell a partial, which I think you're going to talk about, Don, right? Or somebody's going to talk about. Somebody should talk about it. Uh, and if you did the, if you did the uh, sell a partial, if you sold, well, I think this just went bust. Uh, oh, if you sold a partial uh, for the first 103 payments, guess what you'd have in uh, proceeds? Well, you'd have 31,000, right? See what that means? So anyway, or you could also do another thing. You could do a $48,000 loan and make a first and a second and a first lien note and a second lien note. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And if you did a first and a second lien note, then if you had the second lien note have 77 payments which don't start until the first lien is paid off, that's called a two-noter model, and you could do that as well. So there's four different ways, three different ways. Go ahead, Al. And then the fourth way you could do it, go ahead, just click it all the way to the end. Go ahead, is it done? Okay, it's there. So another way you could do it is if we were looking to back into that number of 414.16 and to get the rents, the payments under what rent would be, do we have to make those things equal? No. If you could convince somebody to do it for 6% instead of 7.75%, they'd get 180 payments, 261. What would the second lien payment be? The difference, 152, 56, which works out to be 11.5% interest. Is it common to have a second lien that's higher in interest than the first? Yes. Yeah. If there's a likelihood of payoff, is it going to be the first or the second? The second. If you have limited money, it's the second. Right. So you're creating a situation where you may not only get the 11%, but the, the upflow. So anyway, that's maybe a little bit crazy, but... Wait, let me ask you a question. So between the... Go right the, ahead. The, the two of you scheming up these four ideas and this way you do, what's your current favorite way out of all this? Well, it, it depends on the circumstances because like Walter ran into the situation where there was uh, problems explaining to the... Uh, Barbara, what's your current theory, Walter? Well, I like creating one note and sharing the entity. Okay, we're going to talk about that, but we're not quite there yet. Um, yes, sir? In a wrap, who is responsible for, I assume the new buyer, but the, the property taxes and insurance? Yeah, that would be the new buyer. That's, that's their issue, right? We may have that set up with a servicer, and the servicer collects enough to escrow to do that and pay those off. But that's the responsibility of the buyer, it's their property. Okay. Yes, sir? So in this example, I, mean, I guess Walter needs the money for the acquisition, right? Right, Walter needs the money for the Where acquisition. Where did that money come from? Well, that's because what we did is we created the first lien note of 31000 which gave him enough to get the property and get some cash in his pocket and then we created the second lien note or the wraparound note in order to take the profit on the differential. At the same time. At the same time. Oh, okay. The money from selling the note funded the purchase. Oh, okay. Got it? Okay, I'm just going to go on and yeah, go ahead now. So I like, yeah, that's fine. Keep on going. I, okay, go back. <laughs> Okay, I really like this scenario, and I know this is kind of, but for those who don't know this, it, sometimes you have to hear it more than once. So 
Molly could buy a property for $14,000. It was a burned out property. It had a fire damage, extensive fire damage, in fact. He could sell it to a new buyer who was a contractor for $23,000 with $1,500 down, 7.75% interest, and 72 payments of three seventy four seventy five. dollars That's the basic scenario. So what does Walter get? He gets $1,500 down, doesn't use it, but he doesn't want to use his own money, so what does he do? He calls me up, and what, does he, what do you say, Walter, when you call me up? How are your Greek lands today? He asks that question frequently, and they're always in good standing. <laughs> so look at the amortization schedule on that. Hit the, okay. So if you look at the amortization, everybody sees 21.5 note, 7.75% interest, 72 payments, 374.75. Everybody got that? And Did I miss it? You may have gone the wrong way. Okay, whoa, back. Back up. There you go. Okay, so he calls me up and he says, Quincy, how'd you like to buy that note for $19,000? Now, wait a minute. How's that going to work? Why would he do that? Because $19,000 and because he gets $5,000 from the differential there, right? He gets the $1,500 down payment. That's his pay for the deal. Is that bad? Because he's not using any of his own money. He's using Quincy's money, right? He said, I said, well, let me check. Two minutes later, I said, yes, I'll take the deal. Because the yield to my Roth IRA is 12.2925%. Because I bought the note at a discount. Everybody follow that? Yeah. And when you're dealing with discounted notes, please understand that there's two elements to the profit. One is the face interest, face interest amount. Another is, in this case, the 7.75% interest that he paid, right? The second is what? Discount. The discount. So if you're getting 40%, 40, 40 cents off on the dollar, you make that 40 cents off. On the Assuming it pays off, right. Assuming it pays off, right. Right. So does everybody see that? There's two elements. The face amount of interest and the discount. Now, I calculated my yield of 12.2925%, assuming that the note would pay out, right? Everybody got that? What if it pays off early? What does that do to my yield? It goes way up, right? Because I collected that discount a lot sooner. Everybody kind of following the scheming that we're doing here? Okay. And so go on to the next one. So here's what you do to calculate the yield, which is not to be confused with the interest rate. See, this doesn't change. The note buyer's got his setup just like this, right? What does change? I'm only paying $19,000 for the same cash flow, right? So when I do that and I make this the blank, it comes up with 12.2925%. That's how I calculated it. Now, is that really 12.2925% interest? No, it's 7.75% interest and the discount. But that's an easy way to figure what your yield is. Okay, go on to this next one. So I thought I would sell this on one of the uh, IRA fund cruises or Financial Friends Network cruises. So I said... How do you sell a note, Don? The simple answer is, of course, you can sell the entire note, right, Don? Right. And so I thought, well, this is a pretty good deal. Once he repairs the property, it's going to be worth a lot more than a burned out house, right? So I should be able to sell. I could probably sell it for the 7.75% yield. I was just playing with numbers, and I said, why don't I sell it for a 9% yield? So I said... What would somebody pay for a 9% yield for $19,000? And it turned out to be $20,767.76. So had I done that, I could have realized a gain of $1,767.76 really quickly, right? That would have been a good model, correct? Flip it. And see, all we're doing is saying, like, if we want to hit a 9% yield, remember the buyer's the same, the loan's the same. We want to hit a 9% yield, and we solve for this part up here, the principal, and we get what the value of that is at 9%. Everybody kind of seeing what we're doing? We're switching around the variables that we answer. Go to the next one. Then the second thing I could do is sell 91.39% of the note. And he's saying that's kind of, to use Walter's pet phrase, weird. Why would I do that? 
because at 9% it only takes 342 uh, 49 to amortize $19,000 at 9%. What's the difference? Flip it to Mexico. Then the Roth would keep $32 in 26 months for 72 months or total profit of $2,322.72. Well, now wait a minute. Isn't that higher than the other one? Mm -hmm. but, it's but the other one you get cash when? Immediate. Yeah. Immediate, right? But this deal you get cash every month. How long does it going to take before you get your money back, say, if you invested $100 in this? A little over three months, right? Is that so bad if you're trying to build up an account? Can you just rinse and repeat this time and time and time again? Move on to the next. Okay, and so in that case, we wanted to give our investor 19,009%. There it is. The IRA gets the rest. See how easy this is? Why not go ahead and advance it again? And the, the third thing I could have done is sold a partial. It turns out it would take 64 payments to get the investor almost a 9% yield at $19,000. Flip it again. And so I would keep the last eight payments of $29.98. That's a pretty good profit, right? Mm -hmm. But when does it come? Years later. Years later. So you see, you can actually structure these ways, in these uh, note deals in many different ways, just according to what your goal is. Now, that might have been a fine goal if my daughter was 12, right? And I could get her the money when she needed it. But it's a lousy goal for uh, my Roth, well, not my Roth IRA, for her Coverdell, because it's, you know, you get the picture. Do you? Do you take into account inflation when you're looking at this? Cause well, that's a good point. It's going to be more money, but it's going to be down the road. But the question is, what are you going to do with the money that you get in the meantime? Is $1,700 now worth more than $2,998 later? It might be. It's only 72 months in this case. Follow what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. I don't understand how you could invest with the HSA, and then what happens if you get sick? You never know when you're going to get sick. Well, that's right. The HSA, that's a good point. How did I use the HSA, or I, this one wasn't HSA, but, or was it? Oh, I don't know. I can't remember right now. But basically, I've been blessed with uh, enough, uh, you know, income to be able to pay my bills. So I'm not too worried about the uh, HSA running out of money. So my HSA, because I've invested it and contributed to it every year, is worth over $150,000. So my answer is, sometime I will need it. It's not today. So instead of just leaving it sitting in the bank doing nothing, I invest it, I let it grow, and I'll have a bigger pot of money to draw from when I'm done. Okay? Does that make sense? As long as you're, you, you can afford to pay out of your own. Well, that's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and you save the, all your receipts for your medical expenses in the meantime? <coughs> to get reimbursed at a later date? At any time. Is there, there's no deadline there? Nope. Cool. So, I mean, we could talk about HSAs, but that's, see, that's a different topic. Jim, if you had this one piece of information, if you were relatively certain it was going to be paid off within 24 months, what would you have done? Well, if I was relatively certain, then I'd be looking for an account where I could use it tax-free or whatever. Well, I mean, which of these models would you have used, if any? Uh, well, that's a good question. I, I would have used one of the models, but I wouldn't have cashed it out, that's for sure. So model one is out. Model two is definitely out. Um, you know, I, I guess I would just uh, what hold on to the note, yeah. basically. Well, you kept it if you had that one piece of information. Well, and what Walter's alluding to is that's what happened. The guy that agreed to buy this on the boat, on the Financial Friends Network cruise, said, I'm going to buy that note. I go, okay. So I was going to get my profit, you know, and because I was looking for cash up front. And uh, his deal that he was going to get a note paid off to pay me for this note never happened, so 18 months later or so, the guy paid me off and 
his silly boy tried to negotiate a reduced payoff. I was like, hell no. This is what you owe, dude. But he had fixed the house. <laughs> he had almost finished fixing the house. So he thought he could get a, be slick and get a discount. I was like, no, I'm satisfied if you just pay it out. So he got mad and paid me off. And my yield was several thousand percent. But anyway, that was an interesting deal. Move on. Um, okay, move on from that. Uh, I don't know, that looks like a duplicate slide. Okay, now this is my paper to property to paper deal. <laughs> okay, you ready for this? Because you Don referenced it before, so I'm going to tell you a real story of what happened here. So I loaned $200,000 at 12% interest. 12% interest, by the way, with 12 months means I get 1% a month, right? right. Or 2000 a month. They had a tenal a tenant operating, the borrower set up an operation for a dog kennel and had a tenant buyer paying 3500 a month. So far, so good? Go ahead. And what happened is the borrowers got into a legal dispute and lost the lawsuit and had a $500,000 judgment against them. So basically me being the helpful, friendly guy that I am, I started foreclosing. <laughs> my, honestly, my thought was that I'd never foreclose on it because these people were obviously got to reach an agreement, right? But they kept, it was like, you know, Hillary Clinton and Trump, you know, they kept going like, yeah, you know, like magnets. They just could not get together. And in, eventually they came up with on the day of foreclosure, their story was, okay, I'm going to give him, two, uh, thir what was it? $3,000 a month for the next uh, 60 months and he's going to release the lien. I'm going like, you know, no. First of all, you are like the devil and angel fighting against each other. Everybody's telling me the other side is the devil incarnate, right? I'm going to save your souls and I'm going to take the equity in the property. Oh, so I did. So I foreclosed on it. I leased it to that same tenant for two years. Then I sold it to him for $350,000 at 6% interest with a 15-year AM, AM and 5-year balloon. And his payments were $29,53.50. Now let me break that down for you for just a minute. First of all, what, where did I go from getting 2000 to what? 3500 right, for two years, right? Yeah. Is that a pretty good deal? Yeah. Of course, I had taxes and insurance of so really about 3000 Now, that 3000 figure is important. Because for two years, he paid me on time, still does, for $3,500 in rent. I knew taxes and insurance would be about $500 a month. So really, my net profit was about 3000 bucks a month. So when I set this guy up for seller financing, I want a win-win deal, right? So what I did is I said, well, he's been paying. So he's been paying $3,500 a month in rent. And if he sets aside $500 a month for taxes and insurance, I need to keep his payment around what? 3000 a month, plus he's got to pay his own taxes and insurance, right? So I backed into the number to make sure he could afford the payment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Same thing as Walty, Wally was doing. And then I sold it to him for 350000 at 6% interest. Now, I think you probably picked up that I'm kind of a greedy bastard here. So why would I ever charge him only 6% interest, $350,000? Why couldn't I just charge him like 10% interest? What do you guys think? Higher purchase price. Yeah, that's right. Higher purchase price is part of it. Split to the next one. So let's see how this analyzes out. So that's the just regular amortization schedule. So flip that next one. And the principal balance at 60 months, remember he has a, a payoff. It's 266031 Now, if I'd have been greedy and sold it to him at 10%, flip the screen, well, I would have got 10%. I would have had to reduce the price down to 275 right? And then, one more click, the principal balance at five years would have been 223587 Have Everybody seen what I'm doing here? Mm -hmm. By taking a lower interest rate and a higher price, I'm actually getting more money if he does what? Pays it off. Pays it, pays it off. Now, by the way, 
in both of those scenarios, the payment is exactly the same. So if he paid it out over 180 years, 180 years, 180 months, there would be zero difference in the cash I would put in my pocket. Does everybody understand that? But it's weird, isn't it, that 275 at 10% is exactly the same as uh, 350 at 6 percent. Where, what lessons do we need to learn as note investors on this, right? We structure the deals in the way that makes most sense for us. To him, it made no difference between those two scenarios unless he pays it off, right? Mm -hmm. so, my, so why would I do it that way? Why would I make the choice? Yes, higher sales price. Let's take away the balloon. Now why would I do it? Remember, it's the same for 15 years, so why would I do it? Higher, at, the, at the end of the term, you're going to get paid back more interest. Well, that's... <laughs> well, we're just assuming it's not getting paid off. 15 years, all the payments. You receive a lot more money. Yeah. Do we? No, we don't receive the same amount of money. Yeah, there you go, right there, you got it. The difference is that I took how much is interest calculated at on your, your return? Right. It's just regular, ordinary income, right? How much are capital gains taxed at? 20%. Yeah. So I'm in a high tax bracket, so I cut my tax burden on the profit in, uh, by a great deal by switching it from interest to capital gains. Oh, you didn't tell us you did it outside your retirement account. Well, I did. There's a lot more to the story that I'll tell you at wine time, but... Uh, After how many glasses? One, well, two. Uh, but do you see what I'm saying? The, the simple lessons I'm trying to teach you are that sometimes you have to understand that two things that look very different are the same, and you have to structure the deals in a way that makes sense for what you want to accomplish. And you always want to set up win-wins. Okay, I'll go ahead. Like people go, oh, you're only making six percent of your money, but then if you put in the calculator that you only have two hundred thousand in it, which fixes slip to the next slide. Oh, sorry. That's my yield on the investment. Yeah. Sixteen point eleven five three, and that's if he doesn't pay it off early. And what was that? It comprised of the face amount of the interest and the discount. But I created the discount. Okay. Everybody got that? So go ahead to the next slide. All right, now this is for Dawn Rickabaw, okay? Because Dawn been pestering me, she doesn't like to use trust because she doesn't understand them. So I did a joint venture on a note within a trust, which is what Wally's talking about. He keeps leaving the room, but he keeps talking about he'd rather own a part of an entity, right, than own a part of the note. So this is kind of what I, what I did. It was in an inherited IRA okay, which had 500 bucks in it. So go ahead. These are the advantages. Go ahead and click it all the way down to the bottom. Oops, go back up. One more. So these are the advantages of using a trust, Dawn, okay? One, anonymity. Does anyone know who's the beneficiary of that trust? Nope. Is there any way for them to find out? Nope. Subpoena. Well, okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. They could subpoena you. Only if they had a legal claim against you, though. I watched Gotti last night, so... All right, so everybody see the benefit of that? Is that a good benefit by itself? Take everything else away. Is that a good benefit, Don? Yes. No one uh, can see what's going on, right? Since no one can inquire, absent a subpoena, since no one can inquire, how's anybody going to figure out what's going on? Could you sell a partial in that trust? Sure you could. You can do anything you want to that we all talked about. You can do anything you want to, and nobody's going to see a damn thing. Okay? Simplicity. No explanation needed. If nobody's seeing it, you don't have to explain it to anybody, especially that pesky custodian. <laughs> right? Right. Is simplicity better? Does a confused mind say yes or no? no? No. I don't understand that. I'm not going to process that transaction. I don't know how to enter it into our system. Whereas if the money just goes and it comes back, we're very happy. Okay? And we can make changes. Uh, well, the two-note model 
two note model has negative amortization, so I'm not going to, that may not be Dodd Frank compliant, but you can make changes anytime. Okay, if you sell, uh, you know, a profit interest for months 103 to 105, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. All of this is happening behind the screen. You know, you remember the scene in uh, Wizard of Oz? <laughs> they say, don't look behind the screen. I'm really this big, scary, awful person, right? right. That's what we're doing. We're behind the screen scene and doing things, right? And it's just easier because how, how, Walter, how quick do we fund trust investments at Quest? Sometimes within the same day. Okay, everybody see that? Because for us, we don't care what you're doing within the trust till the end of the year where you have to tell us the fair market values, right? So it's a trust. The investment is not whatever you do with the trust. The investment is the trust. So it makes it a lot easier. I used a trust one time, for example, to loan somebody money at 20%. Now, I checked the usury laws and it was legal, so I put that out there. But you got to understand that at our, my shop, if you give me a 20% note, it's going to get kicked up the ladder to be looked at just to make sure there's no suspected prohibited transaction, right? Well, I didn't want to mess with all that, so I just said, send the money to this attorney. And two years later, or a year later, I got 20% interest that came back, and I closed the trust. No bank account, no nothing. So that's the advantages of using trust. Go on, then. Yes, sir. The, the biggest thing with trust, especially when, when using the IRA, is like, who's going to be your trustee? Because yeah. you've got to trust the trustee, and then they can't be... A prohibited or disqualified person. person, that's correct. How do you, how do you, yeah. how do you get around that? You, what do you, do? You've you don't get around it, you find a trustee that you can right. trust. If we have a, how do you, you know, where do you You're in a room full of trustees, Abby. There's actually services, there's services too that they That's what I heard. There's fiduciary <laughs> services. I, I met an attorney in, down in LA, that's what he does. Yeah. Well, good, there you go. But it's not cheap, probably. Uh, we can discuss this over wine time, I'm pretty sure. So what I did is, Don, let's flip to the next one. I'm going to get through with this. So the original loan amount was $95,000. It was at 12.99% interest. And there was, it was interest only, but it says P&I. But interest payments of $1,028.38 per month. Everybody got it? Now, basically what I did is my daughter's IRA put up the $360 and the other person put up the $95,000. Okay, everybody's with me so far? Flip. And so the note was transferred to the Happy Days Trust. And a joint venture was formed, Dawn, to handle this investment and to de determine the splits of the profits. Go ahead. A loan service ag agreement was entered into, so did the Happy Days Trust take any actual payments? No. No. The loan servicer collected the payments, and the loan servicer sent it to each of our accounts separately. Go ahead. Huh. And basically then, my money joint venture partner received an ACH deposit of 712.46 per month, which if you figure that out is 9%. And my daughter's account got three fifteen ninety two a month for interest. Does that seem real hard to you? Now stop it right there for a sec. Does that seem very hard to you? Is, is that hard to set up? Could it? Could this be a partial? Could this be a discounted note that you purchase? Could it be any of the things that we've talked about? It could be every one of those. Yes, Walter. I didn't, I don't know about you, but it took a little while of processing that if we if we form an entity and we do all the all the splitting up within that entity, it's better. It's a better thing to own the entity than it is to own the assets. So flip to the next screen. Do you guys have like an EIN number for those uh, trusts or no? Well I didn't have one for the Happy Days Trust because I didn't need one. All the payments were going directly into my IRA into my money partner's account. The servicer just split them up. Um, so basically what we did here is we created a trust and this is just a standard trust agreement, right? And you can see the title of the trust and I didn't put all the clauses in here. 
And so we formed the trust, go ahead, and we formed a joint venture agreement. And the purpose was, you see, this is a very limited joint venture agreement. The purpose was specifically to buy that note, that amount, that interest rate, that address, legal description, very simple, right? Go ahead, the next one. The property of the joint venture has to be held in somebody's name. So he said, we're going to make uh, I am trustworthy as trustee of the trust to hold this investment. Everybody see that? Yeah. Next. And then clearly laid out who put in what? 95000 and 360 Next. And profit sharing, was it the same as what we uh, laid out? Yeah, but was it the same as, was it 50-50? No. 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 Did it matter? No. As long as there was no disqualified person that was uh, involved in the transaction. In other words, you can't do this between your traditional and your wife's Roth or something. These were two complete strangers, no disqualified person. Then we split it up how we wanted it. So, so let's see if there's another, oh, there's another screen. Go ahead. Oh, I like that one. Go back one. Oh, okay. I thought I put something on the foreclosure. Uh, is this for? Is this on the little? Uh, oh no 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 no. That's what you have to draw up yourself, Don. But the point was, and by the way, I put in here on foreclosure, who put up most of the money? They did. So I said, if there's a foreclosure, I get point. Oh, it says that up there. Uh, I get the 0.37% of the property and they get the 99 point whatever percent of the property because they put up the most of the money, right? Now, is that legitimate? What do you guys think? Yeah. But do you see the concept? Forget the numbers. Yeah, do you see the concept? Keep all the moving parts inside there. Keep all the moving parts inside, but joint venture. structure the, note, the, the joint venture however you want it. Don, you can't tell me you don't know how to structure notes. I know how you do that. Well, this is a perfect segue into how, how I just beat, I really, we had a lot of a tussle this year, and I was fighting with your people, and you were saying you're, you're a high maintenance, you know, queeny type, and yes, it's true. Like, I'm like, I want you to do what I want you to do. I don't care. If it doesn't yeah, it doesn't really care. Yeah. So what I did, by the way, on the drives, it has some standard information, but it also has how we, uh, our note packet, which if you want to buy a note, it's the forms that you need to buy a note, and the private entity packet, which, you know, is what you have to do if you want to buy a trust. Now, of course, those are going to change November 1st, but it'll be the same forms, just with a different company name. So I thought there's some other general information on there that I just thought might be useful for you guys, especially for Don Rickaball. Well, because this is a great thing because Oh, what did you say again? Say that again. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, if I would have done that in this deal, then we wouldn't have had this big knockdown drag out and, and me going, True. blah, 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 with your people and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so what, what happened is uh, uh, there was a, this is over in the Sierras, property over a couple hours on the other side of the hill here. Uh, and uh, I think the sales price was, I don't know, just super quick. Might not be right. I think there was a 90000 down payment. So that left the note of 209. what? 209. 209. Except for that was a first yeah. of 149 <coughs> and a second of what was that, 60? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> now, it's pretty good down payment, right? Yeah. And also saying, because 50. of the second, mm -hmm. that's kind of like someone who's guaranteeing my note because they don't want to lose this. So they're. If this person doesn't care about losing 90, then I have the second stop. He's not going to want to lose. So that's how it actually has turned out, just so you know. This guy turned out to not be so stable. Now this guy's keeping me whole while he's foreclosing. So I like that because I, I want to buy things that are a good yield that are not a headache for me. But anyway, so, going, so this is what happened. I tried to do this. So we had a... a if this is my sister's IRA, and she and so I bought this note for one ten ish. 
So basically, uh, I had her put in a hundred, and and my Roth put in this. Now my sister is not a disqualified person. Technically true, yes, true. True. So it's okay if we have an uneven thing. As long as there's no other way you're splitting it, so you get a benefit. Well, yeah, it's got to be proportionate. Like if you. No, get, because she's a disqual. She's, she's not, not a disqualified, disqualified person, person unless. Anymore. The only person, person, way that you'd run into trouble with that is if she said, okay, sis, wink, wink, so give me some money under the table because uh, I found, you know, you're just, go ahead. So, so, uh, so anyway, she, she has a safe position and she has a 9.5% yield and she's getting all first money out. But so, so, so what she's I, getting her 100 grand Yeah, so there. she's getting, so basically she's put in, almost all of the money but i think i put on and this is where we got fighting uh is i th i think it works out that let's just say she owns 65 percent of the note and i own 35 percent of the note and so the problem that we got into yeah was that when we got her paperwork we were like okay 65 35 it comes in and then it comes in 65 35 well that's not what she wanted she wanted all payments to go to her sis first and then the rest when in first is paid when the balloon pays off this 10 turns into uh like fifty thousand. <laughs> see what i'm doing there or what she's doing there in three years now, now the question i have for you guys is how the hell do you what's that because of the yield because of the discount and so that i bought probably bought it at a yield of i don't know 18 and I'm paying her that, and she put in most of the money, and she gets first money out. So her principal is going down, 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 down. So by the time the balloon hits, kablam, because mm -hmm. I'm not taking anything now. And it's inside my Roth, so zero taxes ever. Okay, right? so what's the problem that we came in to see? Yeah, she was doing this, then, right? And I said, well, the problem, Don, is that you've got two separate investments, and you're trying to put them on one form or one so it transaction. So you up. So there, is, there are limits to what we can fudge our system to do, right? The easier solution would have been to set the whole thing up in a trust, trust. and then had a joint venture or, agreement. Or I think it would also work if I would have had my IRA buy the whole thing, and then I sold the partial to her, and then it, would that have helped? Yeah, well, yes, because then that would have wouldn't have been splitting If your IRA out. had the money to do that, yeah, it would have helped. Well, I could do a SIMO note, just like you guys did on that. Jackson, I don't have to have the money in there. I didn't have the money in there. Well, okay. Now, <laughs> understand that Quest IRA does not, and Quest Trust Company do not uh, endorse any kind of investment technique or anything, right? You guys heard that, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> and I wouldn't do that many transactions with my sister, by the way, even though she's not a disqualified person. They could make up some story when, of... When it's how, unequal like this. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't even... What is the yield on that? In three years, 10 goes to 50. Good. It's good. I don't have to have a good financial enough. calculator good to know. Yeah, it's good enough. So, good if, enough. like, my, if my dad and I invested, he, he used... I was paying using my own funds, and he was using his IRA. No. Oh. In this no, disqualified. no, disqualified. you're disqualified. Into an LLC that's um, you, buying a property. You're disqualified. He's proportionate along my investment. Yeah, can't you do that? As long as it's proportionate. Uh, proportionate. <laughs> well, and who's going to work the project? Uh, a third party. <laughs> <laughs> he's been answering these questions before. We all know what the reality is. But I thought it was the same rule on that. That's why I brought it up. Where if her sister was bringing all the cash, but but Don's getting all the returns. That's disqualified. That's because well, her because sister is not on the disqualified well, right, person's list. My dad and I. That's but probably I, if the IRA saw the whole movie, they'd say that was an excess contribution and not really an arm's length transaction. So, I mean, it would. So again, basically, we have what, to have you not see what's happening. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Don. In the trust would have been easier. So. Now I got a question here, ma'am. All right. So you got a trust agreement that's owned in a certain manner. Does Quest need to see the joint venture agreement? 
Well, the joint venture partner is actually Quest, so, oh, sure. so they would have to see that. Yeah, one other point I'd like to make is that we now have a way for your borrowers to pay, uh, borrowers and renters to pay directly into your account online. Nice. Now, up till now, it's only been that if they had a, a payment and, and they, they had two split payments, they would have to enter that twice. Now that's no longer true. You can enter one time and enter the split. So could you po potentially, Don, have made the, had the servicer made the payments and just had them uh, enter it as split the way you wanted it? Uh, I, I could have done that. Uh, servicers are going to start using this extensively. Yeah. Because if they have 50 loans, they're going to put one long entry in and boom. But if you told the servicer, uh, you know, put all the money into this account and none in this account, and it just pops in there, what do you think is going to happen? I think it works nice. Ah, so there's ways to do this, isn't there? Yeah, because my my account doesn't get anything till the balloon, so it's my account's invisible for all intents and purposes. I know, but what again, go back to the point I was trying to make, those are two separate investments. Yeah, and I should have split them apart. For you should these. have had two separate investments, and I also had to go over this with my staff. So we're not infallible, of course. So the staff was trying to figure out what the hell Don was doing, and so I had to put together a PowerPoint presentation for the staff saying, look, all they're doing is this. Oh, is that what they're doing? I understand, right? It's the, it's the same thing as a wrap, like taking a $100,000 loan, I put in 10000 something out, so, you know, I'm making a loan at twelve. Uh, I, I borrow somebody's money at 8 or 10, right? It's the same concept except in the context of a discounted note. Correct. It's the same arbitrage wrap. It is. Concept. It's all the same concept. But I will tell you that what's the difficult part of this scenario that she was trying to do is she was having two IRAs at Quest. And so if you had one IRA at Quest and one somewhere else, it, none of this would have mattered at all. Right. Nobody, you can't see or, that whole a non-IRA and an IRA, none of that matters at all right. at that point, right? So it's when you have two at Quest that you have to maybe think yeah. about the, using, a trust. using a trust or having a, something else. All right, Q, I got a question. So let's say I was going to put together a joint venture, $100,000 total. I'm going to contribute 1000 and I'm going to get three other people to contribute 33 each okay and we're gonna take the proceeds out as everybody gets a quarter as everybody gets a quarter oh okay all uh, right so it's kind of like a, a fund to go out and buy houses oh don't be yeah. talking about funds now you're talking about securities law issues and all right, that so joint venture joint venture so that would be a perfect use of this trust you see what happens to me <laughs> What do, you, what do you think? Is that a viable concept? Uh, if you're not breaking securities laws, it could be, yeah. See, I think that that could be done now. And so if I were going to be the rainmaker in that example, then I would get a quarter of the deal. But again, the, the problem you may run into there is that providing a service or is that making an investment? You follow what the problem is there? So you, you, these other rules, remember I said you got to know the rules you're playing by? because these other rules have an effect on this. It's not just the structure, it's the, the other rules that you got to take into account, including required minimum distributions. For example, if you need a, a required minimum distributions, you make this great investment, it doesn't turn out as great as you think, and now it's a rental instead of a flip, and you don't have any money to take your required minimum distributions, that's a problem. So there's, that's why I said, what I said, you've got a whole bunch of factors to enter into that and then you've got your risk tolerance on top of that well, was that helpful uh, even though some people have heard it before it's a matter of perspective and you and you really got to hear it more than once to get the hint so and, and we as far as yeah. yeah you said you made that up just mediation or arbitration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah because of how our, our big where you thought they didn't love you anymore. So. That's right. I didn't, no, I didn't I, think I was in, invited here, oh, actually. Oh, Quincy. In the, in the, in the, um, so then, 
like all these are fancy numbers and great opportunities like you can see that if you're the rainmaker and you're open to the different things yeah but you still got to have what deal flow so it comes down to that other like what's the okay it's marketing how do you oh how do i get those okay so let's just remind ourselves how and we're going i want to get investing in notes how can i do it what's super super low-hanging fruit easy drop down way to get started what's one way huh Are you talking about finding no yeah uh, so okay okay no you're ahead of me you're just a little ahead okay okay what <laughs> okay you will, i have money i have money in my self-directed ira even it's even in there how do i get started i don't know how to get started what is the easiest way to get started investing in notes? Go to the Do you have best marketing ideas of the summit in South? Because it doesn't all these ideas are just academic until you can make it real for yourself and or your kids or whatever, right? So what's the easiest way? Because remember where do notes come from again? They advertise that you got money to do it. Um, okay. Just tell us. Well, I wouldn't advertise. Yeah. Okay. Do we know anyone in this room? Okay. Which which one of these could you participate in as a normal, regular, just mom and pop? You could do this. Does anyone own property? Okay. Carry paper. You're in the note business. Woo! Boom! You're in the note business. Could you make a loan? Oh, you're scared. You're not sure. Is there a broker in the room? No. Oh, yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> slam, slam dunk, easy ways. You're in the note business, yes. It's a lending. It's private lending, but you have a note and a deed of trust. You have a note and a deed of trust. If you buy, if you came to, to me and or, or someone else who has deal flow, Walter, you know, whatever, can you buy a discounted note just from people? So it's the networking. Go to people. So you have to, the fast things, without even having to spend time to even know and like anyone, the fast things is going to him, saying, I got money to lend. Or uh, carrying paper on property you already own. Super fast. Voila, you've got to start in the note business. Get a feel for what the paperwork looks like. Get a feel for how it feels to have payments coming in, and, and you don't even get phone calls. And then go, I wish. And then brag about it to people you know and they go i wish i could get a piece of that and so i'm a partial I, I don't know you know because so start with what's drop down easy to do then you go well well i don't have so and then to me there's there's opportunities there's a lot of opportunities for those who who are creating deals so you don't actually like it took me you know bajillion years to where i have some deal flow and i'm not even a great marketer but because I love this little dog and pony show and sort of pretending like I'm a thought leader, well, then I attract, I attract a certain level of things. So I have positioning, but, you know, I've been working at it for a while, you know, hopping around. Yeah. You don't have to do this. You can be a great marketer like a lot of you guys are. Uh, or, you know, spend time and develop relationships. I've been hanging out with these bozos for lots of years, and I love them so much. But the other thing that people miss is the easiest way to create passive income when you have no money or very little money is to develop private you have to find your own private money right so even if you're buying a 7.75 note you go how can i make money on that because most investors are going to eat i know this guy walter and then you guy so if you could find someone who's happy with six percent money could you make money buying something that's ready all day, every day from Walter? Sure. Because you have almost a two-point two spread. So even without any of your own money, if you can develop from ground up, not from the people who are in the rooms going, yeah, you can make you know, a 1,000% return on your money, you got to talk to the ones that the best they can do on their own is 3 4%. Then they're going to be happy if they trust you and feel confident they're going to be happy with five, six percent. Voila, you are in the note business, just already buying stuff that's already on the platter for you. All right, so just go up to anybody and say, how is your retirement account performing? 
And I can tell you what, my mother's $106,000 traditional made last year is 0.05, a half of 1%. And that's what most people are making, 0.05. Yeah, and what one of my early on uh, investors, the way she's a real estate broker, and she had a listing, and I was the consultant because they were going to do owner carry. They were, it was, had to be a 1031 exchange, so the note had to be sold at closing to the accommodator so they could do the 1031 exchange. So I worked with her as a real estate broker, and then I go, Chris, um, how's, your, um, how's your retirement money doing? She goes, you know, because I'm helping her make 5% on this deal, and it you know, it wasn't closing. It was having trouble, so they, they had to get their price. They had to do owner carry, but then they needed to sell the note and still net this certain amount to buy the next property. You follow in the 1031? And I said, I can find money for this, but why are you're, you're, you're getting $25,000 as a realtor. How's your, how's your investments doing? That's something you should ask. I think uh, I had 300000 in, and I think we're down to 299 I go, well, why don't you make this 8 9%? Why don't you guys be the investor? Now, without talking about if that's a conflict, just fly with me, okay? So she made the money, 25000 as a realtor, both ends of it. Then she took her retirement account, or some portion of it, not her whole account. You should never do your whole account because liquidity, right? If you need money fast, some of these investments aren't super liquid. Then she went from making, losing money on her 300000 then she put it in this deal and she made, actually because it paid off early, she ended up making like 9%. Okay, so, and then she goes, let's do some more of that. That's a good, that's a good idea, you know. And so, for instance, then I got it. this is another thing where I'm heavy breathing. I don't know what's happening. It's, uh, so here, here's a deal where uh, super fast and then we're going to change gears. Yeah. Huh? Take that. Okay, so, so just case in point, someone who, um, they said, gosh, Don, uh, I've got, okay, I'm going to start with, uh, I, this was a, a $900,000 owner carry, it was a mobile home park, they sold for 900000 put 300 down, so there was a $600,000 note secured by a mobile home park, very competent, experienced operator. Um, and that's a, re that's a uh, nice down payment. We ended up buying it. This guy says, I, I have better ways to, I didn't really ever want this. So we bought it for 400000 Okay, so, um, and, and this was only written at uh, 6%. And I think we bought it, I want to say it was 12. I just want to say that's how it worked out. And then, um, and we were pretty, we were pretty happy with that because we expected it to pay off early, and then, uh, and then we would get the unearned discount, and then we'd probably be up to 18 to 20 percent return on our money. That's what I was hoping. But if I was wrong, we were okay with this. So, but, um, and I'm trying to get there. So now, they. Uh, Someone came to me and said, I have this lady who just uh, got a payoff. Her, her husband died, so now she's in charge of trying to deploy her own money. She'd be happy um, if she gets safety. She'd be happy with um, like six and a half, seven percent. So then I go, gosh, this, is, this didn't pay off like in the first two years like I thought. And I go, I'd rather, can you see if... So how is he going to make money, this guy? Because he found cheap capital. So I can sell out. Th this is where he made money. My, my friend that he doesn't really know anything or in, involved, but he's going to make money off of notes because he found cheap money. So then by the time I mean, we just did this last week, the, the, balance, um, the balance by the time... So the balance was this. We bought it for this. So you can see that we make 12%. And there's still an upside there, right? I'd rather take it out now than wait another five years because it won't be as juicy, you know, in terms of the bang and plus. 
all the property stuff I've been doing, man, it just eats up capital like like a baby, just endless. Okay, so um, anyway, so I did take a little discount, and uh, he made some money because he found cheap capital. This is the most finding cheap capital, developing cheap capital is your easiest, most uh, powerful payout to me. <laughs> finding cheap capital that trusts you and will ride with you. So then we, I think we netted 506. So basically we had more than $100,000 on top of the money we put in. It ended up as a, um, I don't know, 16% yield, okay? And we, we took a little discount. But that guy made himself 11 grand just going, hey, I just, just wondering if you have anything hanging around. <laughs> so you bought... And it had a UPV, a balance of, so it was what, a, how much a discount is that? <coughs> yeah. 25% yeah, yeah. discount so, or something? So, but he was paying, 33? That, the person you bought it from was paying 6%. Uh, the borrower? The borrower. The borrower's paying 6 and that's never going to change. Right, right. And then you, you, you bought the note at 400000 So we had a yield of 12. Oh, okay. So that was our yield because okay. of the discount. Okay. Yeah, that might not be exactly, but... And there was an unpaid principal balance of 528. So just recently, because this guy said, I just have someone who wants to deploy a bunch of money all at once, they're happy with six and a half or seven if they have safety. And by now, it's pretty safe. This is seasoned uh, four years already, perfect payment history. Plus, they've improved it, and it just came in and, uh, at a 1.3 mil. So if she's in at 506 against three point is that pretty safe yeah. with a four-year perfect so, payment history you know so so you so you already had the guy that had the money had the borrow or had the lender that had the money see this the lender on this on an owner carry who the lender was you no know i'm saying but who had the 6.5 to bring in the 400 000? this guy who i've just known he's brought me a couple little ideas that never actually worked out and he just goes Hey, I'm back again. Remember me? And I go, yeah. He goes, I. This lady has 1.5 million. She's happy with six and a half or seven. Do you think you could? Let's do something with it. And I go, okay. Now he made eleven thousand dollars on this deal because he found cheap capital. He brokered it. He got paid. How'd you participate in it? Well, because I I had 25 percent interest in this. That's how I I made out. So for my for my hundred thousand, I got one hundred twenty five thousand back, and it's good timing because I was equity rich and kind of cash poor right got at the it, moment. I was just trying to figure it out because it was a little bit. I like your pictures better; it's easier. <laughs> Sorry, I can't do all pictures all the time. Oh, no, so, just, yeah. so can you see that? What did he do? He just goes, "Hey, there's this lady who wants to redeploy money," and he goes, "Ah, oh, no, queen, got anything?" And I go, "Yep, next week, boom." He made 11000 because he found cheap capital. That's the one thing hardly anyone talks about. If you want to make money right now, when I started buying notes, I had no money. I already blew through all my money. I was busy like being an epic failure as an entrepreneur. I had no money. In fact, I had less than no money. So when I got to the point of building a portfolio, I had to use other people's money, and that turned out to be a blessing in disguise. Right? And does it, any following that? So... Because my money partners are my lifeblood, right? I'm just wondering how you paid the guy 11000 Was it part of the deal? Was so, it like a yeah, so good, good question. For, is it legal? Yeah. Heck no. Man, I'm all, all about that, you know. Marijuana is. And you got a guy that's coming into a deal and he's going to broker something. I mean, it's state any, by state. Like Nevada is very stringent on certain things. You got to be very careful. The NMLS here is, or the uh, uh, Nevada mortgage provision here is brutal. You don't want to mess with them. Well, uh, what? Okay, that's a whole nother conversation. I'm just talking about like it. It works out, okay? But like in California, I think you have to have a license to do over seven in a year. But there's no freaking license police. They, you call the DRE, they're lucky to even know what a note is. I mean, buying a discounted note. You know, they, they don't even hardly know. I actually called them and tried to talk to their legal department one time. So the thing is, the six and a half was that um, 
to get her the six and a half percent on the remaining payments, she paid 517. And I told the dude, I'll take 506, see what you can do. You make your own fee. So he goes, I got her to do six and a half. So uh, she, she wired me this, and the next day I ACH'd him 11 grand. Make sense? So anyway, so just ideas. I want to do more marketing ideas because like um, you got to know, leave here with the ideas of one way that's super low-hanging fruit to you to start to participate. You should be able to figure out at least one of these that you can do. Thank you.